<laughs> Ardau, pero gracias. Uh, Fantástico. Y de muy bienvenidos uh, al seminario del Gresip. Hoy tenemos nosotros a Ana María, que nos ha hecho este gran honor de, de, de acompañarnos hoy. Y ya he preparado unas cuantas líneas para presentarla. Um, faré la presentación en catalán, pero ella hará la seva presentación en, en inglés, ¿de acuerdo? Um, por tanto, un segundo, que tengo esas notas de aquí. <laughs> por tanto, hoy tenemos a Ana María, y como he dicho, Ana María es, es profesora de sociolingüística, diversidad y minorías de la Universidad de, de Groningen. Es doctorada en lingüística por la Universidad de, de Padua, Italia, y ha ganado diversos premios, entre los cuales hi ha el que ahora nos hablaba, la, la Vidi Grant del gobierno de, de los Países Bajos, eh, otras becas como ara Impact Grant, el gener de 2021, y la Marie Curie Postdoctoral Fellowship l'any 2016. Tiene una trayectoria internacional durante la cual ha estado vinculada a universidades italianas, alemanas, eh, al Canadá también y ahora a Holanda, a los Países Bajos. Ha participado en numerosos esdeveniments académicos, tales como conferencias, seminarios, escuelas de estío y es esta darrera que voldria destacar, eh, que es aquí on nos van conèixer, que es la escuela de estío eh, a Liubarden, a los Países Bajos, sobre diversidades lingüísticas y, y culturales. Y, y de hecho, hoy nos hablará uh, sobre un, un proyecto de, de, de recerca que va a hacer a Bremen, titulado the, the School of Census, a tool for profiling the multilingual city and planning effective public policies and services, the case of Bremen. Por tanto, uh, ahora donas el paso a Ana María, todo teu y cual se va al dubte, podeu escribir por el chat o al final siempre habrá el ton de preguntas. Muy bien, muchas gracias Catalina y a vosotros por la invitación. Uh, pues estoy muy contenta de participar y aunque parlo y comprenc el catalán, he preferido hacerlo en inglés para el tema de dominio lingüístico, que tengo todas las palabras, més, las palabras més en inglés. Uh, donc, ahora he de uh, pues cambiar al inglés a ver si em funciona esta cosa. Y... <laughs> I will share my screen. So, um... You can see my presentation. Um, it should be already shared. And now I'm going to, yeah, just uh, start the presentation. Do, can you see this correctly? Sí, perfecto. Mm -hmm. Sí, okay. Um, so again, thank you very much. Uh, this is about um, a kind of side project that oh, I'm trying to take this out, but it's not possible, sorry. No, yeah, it's possible. I like it better here. Um, it was about a, uh, a side project of mine. So to say it started out as something more related to the collaboration with my closer community because I live in Bremen, in Germany, uh, which is just the other side of the border from the Netherlands. Um, and I really wanted to collaborate collaborate more with my neighborhoods, with the people I live close by with. Um, and so I started this project uh, that I will also uh, talk to you about, that is Bremen Spricht, uh, Bremen uh, Talks or Speaks, um, in order to try to map multilingualism in the city, as I'm also multilingual and living in a country where my mother tongues are not um, Right, spoken as majority languages, I was very kind of very acquainted with the type of issues that a multilingual person runs into, uh, the children of multilingual families and so on and so forth. So I really wanted to know more about what was the experience of other um, fellow citizens um, or residents in the area. Uh, this slowly, slowly uh, kind of uh, grew more into a research project and ended up in being a museum exhibition that I will also present to you. And now it's uh, going to the phase where I'm really trying to uh, come out with some concrete research questions and a methodology and the research setup uh, in case I want to pursue this research uh, further and in a more deep and thorough way. Um, 
it's very much related to the school census because through this exhibition, Bremen spricht, uh, I discovered that um, getting the information from the school census, that is the way uh, the government of Bremen, which is also a state, collect information about the mother tongue uh, of the pupils in first and fifth grade in Bremen schools uh, throughout the territory. Uh, I thought that this was really a key tool uh, in order to understand better our um, multilingual uh, society. But I will tell you more uh, in the course of the presentation. So um, today I'm going to, first of all, trying to embed the res uh, the re this research in a broader uh, framework, uh, a framework of what uh, I define applied social linguistic. And I will tell you more about it, what I intend about it. Um, then I want to talk about urban policies because um, this is how actually the tool that we can actually use in order to uh, be, uh, to make a difference, to make a change, to make an impact in people's life once we know something about multilingualism and the social linguistics of multilingualism. And I'm going to talk about uh, briefly about the three types of goals that normally are um, set up in these policies when language uh, is mentioned. Um, so urban policies actually very seldom mention language as a factor, but when they do, they either talk about well-being, the socioeconomic integration, or the participation of migrants. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that um, because this is kind of uh, the theoretical framework in the end of um, the entire um, thing. Then I'm going to introduce you Bremen spricht, so the citizen science uh, project uh, from which everything began, my interest in the first place and the collaboration that are actually in place uh, at the moment. And I'm going to close with some possible relevant research questions. Um, that I'm trying still to develop. So they are very preliminary and I would really welcome your um, feedback on those uh, and on possible methods uh, that could match um, those questions in order to answer them uh, yeah, at, at best. Uh, so this is a special issue that is, uh, that is planned for the journal of language and discrimination. Uh, the special issue will be titled Language Policy and Diversity Management for Social Justice. It collects um, contribution from different fields, from linguistics, but also social sciences and social cultural studies. Um, this is because we want to uh, keep together the fields of language policy and diversity management. And we want to conceive of language policy in the spulky sense, uh, so to say. So we want to include both uh, attitudes and ideologies, uh, well, not only both, but attitudes and ideologies, practices, and uh, management. Um, this is intended, as I was mentioning at the very beginning in the index of this presentation, as a framework that can be called applied. Uh, applied in the sense, uh, not, not the sense that we are also going to shape the policies or to give advice uh, to uh, uh, on how to make these policies once we know something about the multilingual uh, situation uh, or the social linguistics of multilingualism of the community that we are interested in. But because um, me and my colleagues, uh, which are um, Flavio Ero, Seono Cli, and Aurélie um, Jobert uh, here at the Ruch, at the University of Groningen, in the department Minorities and Multilingualism, uh, we developed uh, the idea that uh, at least uh, as a starting point, social linguists like us or cultural uh, scholars like uh, Flavio, for example, or Seonok, uh, we want to make sure that um, we are at least be able to, um, to uh, determine uh, what groups uh, specifically within the broader civil society, in the local governments, in the institution, in the private workplace, in the media, um, in the educational settings, what exactly what groups are going to benefit from our research results. We see a too broad like kind of gap between the research being conducted and the people actually um, doing the policy in the civil society and in everyday life, like really taking decision, um, meeting people with a multilingual background and taking decision for them, uh, hiring decision, decision about their housing, 
um, situation, decision about their grades. Um, and we know that all these people need social linguistic knowledge, but they lack it. And we know that there is a lot of social linguistic scholarship going on, but there is a big gap uh, in order to reach out to those people. Uh, a lot of a entire framework has actually developed in order to um, bring about this gap, um, which is the collaborative uh, social linguistics, citizen science, and so on and so forth. But this is very, very um, costly in terms of money, in terms of efforts. It costs a lot of money to bring in the uh, societal partner into our project, and not all the researchers have uh, that uh, capacity. So in order to be able to at least make our research results relevant to a specific group, in order to be able to reach out to them quite directly, uh, we decided that we were going to, uh, for each paper in the special issue, identify a group of people within the local governments, as I said, within the institution, within the private workplace, in the media or in the classroom that could actually benefit from our research results and try to think about this group of people when drafting our papers. Um, not because we we want to be less scientific, but because we want to be very much applied and directed to the stakeholders. So we conceive of management as the conscious and explicit efforts to influence or intervene on language and cultural practices. And in this uh, sense, uh, the managers are not only the manager in, of a company, but are all the stakeholders that have some sort of gatekeeping functions. I already mentioned some of them, for example, real estate agents are indeed managers in this sense. They decide who get or not an appointment to visit an apartment in a certain neighborhood. Teachers are absolutely gatekeeping, uh, have a gatekeeping function in this sense because they decide the grades and the academic path of uh, students. Um, and also people, for example, working in the private workplace are also stakeholder. I have also gatekeeping function deciding who can be hired uh, or not, and not to mention uh, public officers and uh, employees. So um, all of them have some managerial function in this respect, and all of them could actually be um, uh, interested in knowing more about uh, research in social linguistics. Uh, I want to say uh, just one thing more about this, um, also, although I already spent a lot of time on this slide, but I think it's very important that I was uh, recently invited to a big workshop of uh, the state of North Rhine-Westfalen uh, in Germany. Uh, they organized a very big conference about multilingualism and they invited us to give a workshop and also um, a plenary lecture to a very big crowd of, uh, of people. And when I had my workshop, uh, well, with uh, just a group of these um, um, attendants, about 25, um, and I mentioned uh, data from social linguistic work and I asked them, they were all stakeholders, so uh, either public officers or teachers, and I asked them what kind of data they would benefit from, uh, they were completely unaware of the kind of data I was talking about. They, have, they had no idea of the kind of research, uh, both in qualitative or in quantitative um, yeah, perspective, um, social linguists, for example, in my group or other groups would make. Um, and they actually reply to me that they already have all the data and they just need the money to hire more people. That, that was a general feeling, very, very, um, very honest from the crowd. And I really felt there was a huge gap from what I intended of a social linguistic data that could inform their policies and their practices and what they actually thought uh, the university could give to them. Um, it's like we were speaking two different languages. So. Um, I'm trying to work on this direction and try to bring this um, uh, group of people together to work uh, better um, together for the sake of social justice in general. So why cities? Uh, well, cities are actually uh, quite um, the right place to experiment uh, new uh, innovative uh, policies. They are very versatile. Uh, many times they are directed by um, uh, quite uh, 
um, yeah, dynamic people that are um, open to experiment new thing and to uh, improve in order to improve the um, well, the, 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 the situation of their uh, residents. Um, but also for another reason that is the quantity of people that actually is going to live in cities, um, is already living in cities and is going to live in city in the future. So this is a quote from, sorry, my light just went off. This is due to the fact that they're not moving enough. So uh, I need to gesture a little bit more. Um, I, let me see if I can move this so I can read the quote properly. Yeah, so um, managing urban areas has become one of the most important development challenges of the 21st century. Our success or failure in building sustainable cities will be a major factor in the success of the post-2015 United Nations Development Agenda. This is a quote from the director of the um, United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs um, in 2015, when they actually issued uh, or in that period they issues the uh, sustainable development goals the 17 goals that uh, need to be met in order to um, live in a sustainable uh, world uh, and a lot of that has to do with cities in fact um, the development goals has, have also been integrated in another uh, policy document from the united nation which is the a new urban agenda and actually um include a lot of policy recommendations um, in order to uh, build more sustainable cities. So of course, not all is about language, uh, but my take is that a lot is about language. So we could actually embed our uh, policies within this broader framework of the need of building new, uh, uh, new more sustainable cities. Um, in 2050, for example, 68 of the world population will live in urban areas, at least this is the estimate. And when such a big number of people is concentrated in one place, well, you have all kind of uh, um, social uh, phenomena um, actually affecting the, the, the society. There is extreme poverty, uh, there is unemployment, uh, socioeconomic inequalities are to be expected, and there are also phenomena of marginalization and segregation within the city. We will see that this is, for example, is a case also for Bremen, which is uh, a present day city, not even very big, like of mid size, but it's actually the case for most of the cities that you tend to have, for example, marginalization and segregation uh, happening in certain district for a multiple set of reasons. Um, and of course, cities actually face this challenge of integrating migrants and refugees into their public space. So when we look at, and I will go very briefly uh, um, through this, but uh, when we look at public policies uh, and when we look at even uh, transnational policies like uh, the new urban agenda, whenever language is mentioned is for one of these three uh, more general goal. Either it is to foster well-being or to um, foster the socioeconomic integration of the migrants or the diverse population, uh, for example, local indigenous minorities, uh, or it is to foster participation in the public debate and in the public sphere. So when it is mentioned, when well-being is mentioned, um, we can assume is uh, actually rarely uh, spelled out, but we can assume that uh, the emotional well-being is intended, the emotional well-being of individuals and families, uh, that actually could benefit uh, from policies that aim at the maintenance of their own um, either ancestral or heritage language. Um, it's also because of economic advantages. For example, it's uh, kind of well known that um, multilingualism brings about mobility and mobility is desired. Um, for example, it, it is desired at the level of the um, European Union. There was a big project I also participate, participated in um, some years ago that was the MIME project, uh, 
MIME stands for Mobility and Inclusion uh, in Multilingual Europe. And that project was exactly all about the trade-off between uh, multilingualism and mobility. Multilingualism brings about mobility, but mobility brings about a social um well, uh, social uh, disconnection and a social issue, so, uh, social exclusion, uh, because mobile people tend to have a difficulty in integrate uh, or can have a difficulty in integrating. Um, another, um, well, um, another issue is that, uh, for, for example, that multilingualism or the let's say diversity, promoting diversity through policies can help in building respect. Uh, opening opportunities to think outside the box, uh, for example, uh, because if we know our neighbor and uh, if we know more about their uh, culture, heritage, language, and so on, well, we are more likely to um, have positive relationship uh, with them. The socioeconomic integration, it's all about um, work and access to uh, basic services. So we want uh, migrants and newcomers to be able to access to services and we want them to be socioeconomically include in our societies. And in order to uh, reach this goal, uh, most if not all policies focus on learning the host language, um, the majority language, uh, which is of course, uh, very clever to do because that's the first thing but um i i'm always a little bit struck by the fact that when actually we talk about integration we are talking about a dynamic two-way process so whenever there is integration to be uh, considered we have to consider that the it's not that the people that move have to be integrated somewhere but there should be a dynamic process that has two um, actors in there, which is uh, the local or the long-term residents, uh, so to say, of the area and the newcomers. And all the parts have to play a role. And the part of the newcomers is kind of obvious. They have to learn the host language. What is less obvious is the role of the long-term residents in the area. So their uh, function in this dynamic two-way process is less um, studied, less um, less defined, I would say, uh, and a little bit, a little bit vague. So this is something that um, one could work on a little bit. The third goal where language is actually mentioned is to foster participation. And by participation, I mean uh, civil engagement. So for example, through the promotion of grassroots organizations in the territory, the participation in social life. Um, and that's a key point, the representation in the institutional um, domain and in the administration. Um, of course, one could imagine so many policies that have to do with that, but uh, you're not, we're not going to talk about this anymore. This was just a general framework that I may or may not uh, refer to again in the in the last session about the specific research question that I have in mind for the Bremen case. And again, for this point, most of the policies actually are focused on the newcomers learning the host language. And the role of the long term resident population is a little bit less speci specified. Okay, uh, now I want to go to Bremen spricht, um, which uh, is a project that was uh, directed from the CIS. The CIS stands for uh, Zentrum for Migranten und Interkulturelle Studien, um, which is an association with the decades of activism in, in Bremen, and actually um, uh, the host of the entire exhibition was the Fokker Museum, which is a city museum. Uh, uh, in Bremen, um, and the scientific cooperation was actually uh, provided by by us, by the Ruch, um, and by me in specifically. So um, actually, the curators of the exhibition was um, Valentina Rojas Loa from the CIS and myself from the Ruch, and of course we had all the support from the uh, Fokker Museum for um, designing the exhibition and setting up uh, the entire. Uh, think. These are some pictures from the exhibition. You see the maps that I'm going also to talk about in a moment. 
uh, you see the, the portraits, books, and there was much more. Uh, the area was called the Stadlabor uh, within the Fokker Museum. I want to mention that because it's very, um, I mean, it's kind of um, surprising um, that the museum actually has a specific area, which is about 100, 120 square meter, uh, specifically for projects that promote the dialogue between the museum and the civil society. So they are actually um, uh, given that space for multiple projects that have multiple purposes and they are coming from the society so they are they are kind of hosting the society within the museum to do all kind of very different and innovative projects and I think that's very valuable and uh, yeah that was um, instrumental to have this exhibition in a very central location and prestigious location as well um, but entirely conducted uh, from um, from external people and the civil society specifically in, well, impersonated by the CIS, so that this uh, Center for uh, Migrant Studies. Uh, this was uh, a project within uh, citizen science. Citizen science is, uh, or in this case, citizen social linguistics is an emerging paradigm, as I mentioned at the beginning, exactly to bring that gap between uh, academic uh, administrators, politicians and civil societies in order to make the research results uh, immediately available to the public in order to shape together research questions and research designs in order to learn from the citizens from the residents uh, and in order to have this uh, general exchange of knowledge happening um, not when the project is done at least that's my how I intend uh, specifically citizen science and citizen social linguistics in particular but from the very beginning from the setup um, and uh, yeah so a few uh, information about Bremen uh, just to give you an idea of what kind of city we are. Uh, actually, I forgot to put a map, but it's really very in north uh, west Germany, clear, uh, very uh, close by the uh, border to the Netherlands. Um, it's a state, but you will see at least the maps of the of the city that we'll show you in a moment, but not the geographical map. Um, it's a state that means that it has a, a, a federal government. Uh, so uh, there are ministries that tend to have some kind of um, freedom on the different um, decisions and issues, specifically in certain areas. Um, it's about 550,000 uh, residents, about 80% are German citizens. Uh, but 35% of the population uh, has uh, a migration background. That means that either they came as um, after birth, uh, so um, later um, to Germany, or they have at least one of the parents uh, migrated to Germany uh, after a certain date. Uh, so this is a definition of um, migration intergrund uh, in in, in Germany. Uh, about 35%, it's a very high percentage. It's possibly one of the highest of uh, German federal states. And very interestingly, uh, this percentage uh, boosts among the school population. Um, we had access to the school census, uh, thanks to the collaboration with the um, uh, Senatorin for Kinder und Bildung, which is the Ministry for uh, Children and Education of the state of Bremen. And uh, the, the census was quite clear that um, all over the past five years, at least 50% of the school population has declared a mother tongue a different from German. Uh, it was interesting to see, uh, to know about Bremen uh, branding. That's um, branding. It's something that uh, we've all learned about during the school, the summer school uh, of uh, linguistic and cultural diversity that also Catalina mentioned at the very beginning where we actually met. Uh, because Varda Belavas, a scholar from the University of Rotterdam, um, 
actually took uh, gave a course about branding, city branding in particular. And that for me was the opportunity to go and explore a little bit more Bremen branding. And Bremen brands itself as a very diverse uh, society. Uh, Bremen is bunt as the motto. Um, Bremen likes diversity. Um, and there is an entire branding strategy uh, actually happening um, and being quite well known uh, and quite present in the city. But this was just uh, to mention that uh, it doesn't really um, play a role in, in this research. So uh, what plays a very major role uh, in, the, in the research that I'm about to show you is this Anmeldebogen. So this is the uh, form that the parents of the school children have to fill in when they enroll their kids in the first and the fifth grade, which correspond to a primary and secondary school uh, start in, in the German system uh, in Bremen. So um, you can see that um, here specifically, um, parents are asked to um, cross, uh, uh, to pick a Muttersprache, so mother tongue, and they have the option of uh, that either being German, uh, Turkish, uh, Kurdish, uh, Russian, uh, Polish, or on another line, English, French, and Spanish, or something else. Um, so this is exactly what was translated in a big Excel database that we've received and we've used to um, draw the maps that you are about to see. The maps that you are about to see were actually um, uh, designed by Vittorio dell'Aquila and uh, also with the help of Valentina rojas Locha, myself and uh, Lara Heinz. Uh, well, but first, uh, let me, uh, I forgot I had this uh, quote in here, because we also ran some interviews among the Bremen residents, well, multiple interviews, and some of them actually to the people that had filled in that questionnaire uh, to enroll their kids. Um, and there was this case of um, the speaker, Nele Kuhn, Bremen resident, a speaker of French, Arabic, and German, and uh, she wanted to, sorry, go back to the form. She wanted to pick um, Arabic and German as the mother tongue of the child entering primary school. But actually, she was told, but sie zu Hause in der Küche sprechen, interessiert uns hier nicht. That was not meant in a bad way. Of course, it came across in a bad way, but it was, of course, not meant in a bad way. What the officer at the school meant uh, was um, with this question, we want to know whether your child understands German. Uh, so whether they are able to follow uh, classroom uh, teaching and not what you speak at home, that's not the aim. Well, in fact, what Nele replied on that occasion uh, was, well, that's fair enough, but this is not the question that is there in the questionnaire because you are asking me about the mother tongue. And if I have to answer about the mother tongue of my kids, I'm going to answer that they speak Arabic and German. Um, she is Nele, and uh, this is an illustration by Katharina Berndt, uh, made for the exhibition. Uh, we have multiple of them. Actually, our illustrator uh, draw uh, multiple illustrations uh, from the people who participated in the interviews, uh, it, whether if they uh, allowed us, of course. And um, this exactly reflects uh, the situation that Nele spoke about in the interview. Uh, and this is a full uh, transcript of the excerpt. Uh, if ever I can share the slide and someone is interested in the context of the quote that I just gave, um, this is uh, of course in German. Okay, what did we do with those data it was a very, very big Excel uh, database um, about all the answers given in the last five years by all these pupils entering first and fifth grade in the entire Bremen and Bremerhaven actually also. Um, I will show you what we decided to do, me, Vittoria dell'Aquila, Valentina Rojasloa and Lena Eins. 
Uh, we did basically um, three types of maps. Uh, this is the first one. Uh, this is a little bit to uh, just give a space uh, in the exhibition to all the languages. Uh, this contains uh, the, all the languages that were recorded in the census, uh, about 80. Um, you could see that there are bigger and smaller language that depends on the number of speakers the languages have in their neighborhood. The entire uh, maps are divided in the 88 uh, Ortsteile neighborhoods in which Bremen is divided and all the data that you will see, it's always reported to the specific neighborhood and not to the entire city. So if you see, for example, um, Turkish in big uh, up here, I'm not sure whether you see my cursor. I assume you can see it. See, you see, can, we see, can it, see it. Huh? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, well, uh, this is because in this area, uh, Turkish have a high number of speakers uh, and not because it has at the, at the city level. You may probably be able to find smaller Turkish around, although I'm not entirely sure. Um, and also you find that um, some uh, languages are in um, small uh, caps and the other are in... Um, well, capital letters. This is due to the fact that some languages ha are taught uh, as, uh, well, uh, in different ways are taught in the school system and some others are not. So uh, Italian, uh, Kurdish, Serbish, um, Serbian and Arabic are somehow taught at different levels, of course, uh, Turkish uh, and so on. And those that are in small caps are not at all taught in the educational system. Uh, this is another card that we, another map that we decided to do, and that concentrates on uh, the um, major languages, but not as a city level, at the neighborhood level. So. It actually shows the, I guess they are uh, nine, if I'm not wrong, nine languages that are spoken by at least 5% of the population uh, in at least one neighborhood. Um, we prefer to do that because we think that it's much more relevant, for example, that in this area, Romanian, which is in, uh, in orange, is spoken by, uh, well, in this case, is a little bit, um, I think it's about 8% of the school population, so already a kind of a salient uh, number. Um, we think that it's much more relevant that this um, percentages is showed up where exactly these people is concentrated, because at the city level, uh, something, the numbers get a little bit blurred, and you never know whether they are relevant or not, or to whom, uh, and who could benefit actually from knowing that there are this number of Rom Romani speaker, not Romanian, sorry, uh, Romani speaker, um, this in, uh, in orange, at the city level. I think it's much more, well, we thought it was much more relevant to uh, say exactly where uh, this, um, well, there is a higher concentration of speakers. Same goes for um, the Kurdish in, uh, in pink and the uh, Turkish in light blue, uh, the Russian speakers in uh, dark blue and so on. Okay, this is an explanation more in detail about how we actually build up the algorithm for this map, but I think I'm going to skip it because it's not exactly relevant. But if you have a question, I can, uh, I can explain. So this is taken from uh, a, um, a booklet that we did in the um, exhibition uh, about all the maps and about all the data that we had from the school census. And you can see the contrast, for example, from these two neighborhood. Um, these are not too far away, one from another, but this is Peterswerde and this is Teneva. And you can see that although the number of pupils are uh, kind of the same in both of them, although they are, uh, I think, more in Teneva, uh, but the majority, the great majority of pupils in Pertuswerde has German as a mother tongue, 91%. And the number of people who ha actually have a, another mother tongue are really reduced. Uh, I mean, the absolute number, we are talking about 14, 12 uh, pupils within an entire uh, neighborhood. But once we go to Tanefa, 
well, we have an entirely different picture there. And the German speaking children, German speaking as declared mother tongue on the form. Of course, there is different level of multilingualism here. And most of the children actually already speak German when they enter primary school. But still, the declared mother tongue of so many of these uh, children in the first and the fifth grade are other languages. So mainly we have Russian or Turkish, Arabic, Kurdish, uh, Polish, uh, highly relevant percentages of Twi speakers, um, also English, uh, Albanian, and so on and so forth. So this starts to be relevant number, especially in this broader picture. So we really wanted to show, and we have this pie chart for all the 88 neighborhoods, and they are also in the booklet, so that any people visiting the exhibition could actually um, look at the booklet and actually point to their own neighborhood, the neighborhood where they work or live, or uh, they visit or they have friends in, and exactly th see the composition of the school population. Of course, we are assuming that the school population is telling us something about the general population, and we think that it does, actually. It's, again, you see, yeah, <laughs> and it does, actually. Um, I think uh, it's a good way of mapping um, the general population. So uh, we know that multilingualism actually uh, give rise to inequalities. I also mentioned, of course, at the very beginning, because it's a very, um, I mean, the, the, uh, the grounding of the entire interest uh, I and other social linguists have in, in the topic. Uh, and these inequalities, once you start actually trying to focus them better, uh, mostly have to do with house and job searches. This is really uh, relevant. And there is actually a study specifically on Bremen, and this is Dubois 2019. We are going to see a graph from, uh, from this paper in the next slide that actually show how uh, people with different accent and even with different names uh, have different types of possibilities of getting or not getting an appointment for a viewing in the different neighborhoods. And it's very telling. We had that graph also uh, well visible in the exhibition because we thought it was uh, extremely relevant. Although it ties with uh, the research done in um, um, American social linguistics by Bao, for, this, for example, about uh, discrimination happening during uh, phone calls for actually for um, visiting an apartment, it actually replicate one of those experiments in the Bremen scenario with um, the Bremen context. Um, inequalities are also to be seen uh, extremely uh, uh, and also in dramatic ways in the educational context with multilingual pupils and pupils with a migration background statistically having um, worse uh, notes uh, and grades than the monolingual or local uh, long-term residence uh, peers, uh, which is uh, well known and also impact the career path, um, the academic, but also professional career path of these children. Um, it happens in doctor-patient communication. So in fact, the hospital are highly relevant uh, places and highly relevant partners in this kind of research uh, in order to, um, yeah, try to lessen the um, amount of uh, discrimination and uh, um, yeah, bad communication happening at this level, which is actually uh, extremely relevant uh, because we have to do with uh, life of death issue in some cases. In the courtroom, that's also uh, very relevant. And this is a graph graphic that I was uh, telling you about. Uh, I hope you can see it well. Let me see if I can move this on a side. So uh, these are uh, four um, neighborhood in Bremen, Walle, Schwachhausen, Teneva, and Gropelingen. Uh, Teneva, you saw that before, was a highly multilingual uh, district. Uh, Schwachhausen is actually where Peterswerda, uh, no, it's not where Peterswerda is. Uh, Peterswerda is not here. But Schwachhausen uh, looks like Peterswerda in terms of composition. Um, so uh, you have in pink uh, American accent, so a person like coming with 
talking German, but speaking like a, a US uh, American uh, person. In blue, you have the Turkish accent. Uh, in light green, you have the Turkish name without accent. And in dark green, you have the German local accent and name. So if you focus on Schwachhausen, which is the most striking results, uh, but Gropelingen and Valle also follow the same pattern in a way, you see that um, the Turkish speaker have very few option of getting uh, a view for an apartment. Um, and we are talking about um, private uh, real estate agents. So like an agent putting out an announcement for, uh, I think it was uh, a small apartment and a female voice uh, declaring uh, being a nurse um, was actually asking for a viewing. But the Turkish speaker got very few appointments while you can see that the German uh, local speaker got many more. Right? Almost all the phone call ended up in an appointment given. Um, what is also striking is that just having a Turkish name have reduced more than half the possibilities of getting this appointment. Uh, while having an US American accent, yeah, it does not really grant you uh, an appointment 100% uh, of the time, but almost 70% uh, of the time um, you can get an appointment with that accent. So this is statistics, um, and this proves something which is uh, known um, to be uh, true, but sometimes we think that is hearsay, uh, but once we look at the statistics, well, it's something more than hearsay. Although it's also very difficult to act uh, on this or to do something about this, but yeah, this is exactly the point of the research questions that I'm going to develop. This is a newspaper article that uh, was published in 2018 in the Bremen uh, Weser Courier, so the main local journal, and actually is taking on the results of the PISA studies. Um, the PISA studies are this um, uh, program for international student achievement that have been implemented in multiple states. Um, around the world and actually measure, well, in this case, the reading capacities of pupils um, in both 2003 and 2006, and in both the first and the second generation of speakers. And you will see that Germany, as well as the Netherlands, as well as many other countries have um, a, a very bad scores uh, for um, first and uh, crucially a second generation speakers, even worse for second generation uh, pupils uh, in reading score. The, the minus is compared to the general mean of the reading score of the school population. So the, the gap is real and, um, and uh, wide, also at the educational level. Uh, these are other maps that we did on. Uh, should I look at the chat? Maybe there are some questions. No, no. tranquila. Son preguntas para después y personas que que se están acomiadando cuando surti. Ah, de acuerdo. Muy bien. Muy bien. Gracias, Catalina. Um, yeah. Then going on. Um, these were also maps that we uh, showcased in the exhibition, and these were um, thematic uh, maps. Corobletas. Uh, that means that they only show one language. In this case, it's Turkish, and they show, given the um, um, yeah, the, the the darker or the lighter uh, color shades, you can understand that there is a, a higher or um, a lower concentration of uh, people who declare Turkish as a mother tongue for their kids. Um, and we also included the spots where. Uh, Turkish, in this case, Turkish is uh, used or taught at, in some way in the school system. And we did it for um, all the languages that have higher concentrations in certain neighborhoods. So Turkish, Arabic, Russian, Kurdish, Polish, and Bulgarian. So to... Um, to close uh, the issue of the Bremen Spricht and go to the research question. Um, in general, in Bremen Spricht, uh, what we 
understood uh, in the process of uh, well, creating the content for the exhibition and setting it up and the interchange with the stakeholders and all in the in the guided visit that were organized in the workshops that took place uh, before um, or within the exhibition or right after the exhibition. In general, we intended the entire process as a call to the gatekeepers. As I said, those managers which again are real estate agents and owners, teachers, uh, but also pediatricians, something that I didn't mention, but that was also showcased in the exhibition was uh, how multilingual uh, children, especially um, uh, with certain types of, bilingual, of multilingualism, uh, so to say, um, coming from specific areas are, um, well, they are diagnosed very late or they go underdiagnosed or not, they are not diagnosed with um, learning um, disorders or um, disabilities. Uh, this is because most of these disabilities of disorders are actually related back to multilingualism. Or there is a lot of confusion uh, from the side of the um, specialist pediatricians in the first place of what is related to multilingualism, like kind of naturally or physiologically, and what is actually not related to a multilingualism and must be addressed in a different way. Um, this creates, uh, again, uh, adds to the gap because multilingual pupils who are not diagnosed with a learning uh, disability or disorder, um, well, uh, will have, will, will struggle much more than their peers monolingual who are diagnosed before entering school and receive treatments and um, therapy for that. So uh, that's a kind of a big issue. But also members of the institutions of the government, of the administration, uh, public employees, uh, people in the front office services, people in the hospital, uh, at all level, in fact, in the hospital. That's something that's not included in here, but I think it should be uh, bullet point on its own in the health care. So uh, this is coming to an end. I hope I'm in time, more or less, Catalina. Sí, sí, tranquilo. Thanks, thanks. <laughs> Move. Fantastic. Um, given all this, as I said, this all started out as a little bit of a um, of a side project because I wanted to be more um, engaged in my own community and I had friends uh, in the Centrum uh, for Intercultural Studien. So we decided to do this together, um, this uh, project together. Uh, and I'm only now trying to uh, make up my mind around more specific and concrete research questions. And they are really, it's really still uh, much up in the air. Um, but one of the research questions that I would have is what are the social linguistic needs of the residents in highly diverse neighborhoods in Bremen? So we have seen that there are many different neighborhoods with radically different ecologies in there. And I would be curious to understand, I think it would be needed before shaping any policy to understand exactly from the social linguistic point of view, what do they need? Do they need more German? Do they need more... Uh, support in their heritage uh, languages or what else um, related to this. Um, I would also like to see how language is embedded in existing policies in Bremen. Actually, there is um, a quite um, substantial uh, Rahmen concept for diversity that has been drafted um, and it's around, I, although I'm not entirely sure uh, to what level of implementation it has reached uh, at this point, but uh, it's substantial and there is a lot of uh, uh, reflection and data into that uh, Rahman concept for diversity. Mm, so one of the things would be to uh, analyze that more in detail and analyze also other policies that may be in place, um, maybe just practices or way of addressing specific questions. Uh, I think the census itself is a, a policy, a way of uh, collecting data about language, which is very valuable. And uh, I will come to that um, 
I think in the point four, yeah. The third question would be what social linguistic data are useful to administrators, politicians, and other stakeholders in the city? So these managers that I was mentioning all the time. And this is a kind of a tricky question given the experiences uh, that I reported back to you about this uh, workshop I gave to the multilingual uh, conference in Nordrhein-Westfalen where I kind of perceived a huge gap in the way we were intending social linguistic data research um, and in the kind of mutual understanding about the concepts that we were using in daily practice, in dealing with the public and in research um, based on social linguistic concepts. And the fourth is, uh, once we know what data are useful, how can we elicit and generate such a data through, um, sorry, I have to move this. Well, through the school census or other means. So depending on what kind of data, the school census could be a way to elicit those data. Or maybe we can think of other means of eliciting specific data that can be useful to, um, to specific group. But still, I, I would like to focus on the school census because I think it could be potentially a huge uh, source of information. Uh, but maybe there are some work. So the concept and the questions uh, that are asked in the form are vital to actually elicit certain data or other. For example, now the question is about the mother tongue, which may be problematic under several respects. So actually my last slide is about uh, the census data and the census form. Uh, when Catalina and I met uh, at the school, a summer school for language and cultural diversity, I actually gave a workshop on, uh, on this form on how to possibly modify, intervene to reshape uh, the form, uh, the questions uh, that are asked in the form and the concepts that are used in the form. So um, I think that the census data could be used to monitor the changing profiles of local communities. Uh, for example, the type of maps that we drawn, I think they are very, um, well, once you, one has the data and has decided on how to use those data to build the maps, it's quite mechanical to build new maps for a different cohort. Uh, for for new years, so to say. So that could be a quite um, quick and um, like a very cheap way of monitoring the local communities. So one could visually see how the communities change um, and could also uh, monitor help monitoring immigration trends. Uh, the vitality of specific language and also the pace of linguistic assimilations of the migrants because they may tend to, uh, for example, in um, for example, a kids that declare the mother tongue being Kurdish in the first grade maybe um, end up uh, declaring German as a mother tongue in the fifth grade. So we may see um, pace of linguistic ass assimilation like hidden in in the data. Um, it could help in detecting the need for additional instruction in the majority language at the a neighborhood level. I was told that most of this detection is made by the teachers during the first week of schools, which is of course uh, how it should be. But at the more general level, at the uh, neighborhood level, uh, having a more broad view about the numbers and the distribution of the uh, speakers can, well, this, pupils can help. It could also help for planning uh, minority language support uh, in the education, but also not in the education, for example, in the healthcare sector. Um, because another, that's point four actually, it could help in uh, shaping the provision for translation services and other services in the hospital, in the public offices, in the different areas. For example, if we know that the Kurdish speaking population is um, concentrated in a certain area, uh, we could 
strengthen um, the um, the uh, translation services in the hospital and other healthcare institution in the public offices for that language and community because we know or we assume that um, there will be many of them. But I don't think that all of this could be achieved with the questions as they are in the in the census. Um, Oh yeah, another point number five is about using the thematic cartography mostly to uh, raise uh, practitioners and residents awareness about language. I think it's quite powerful once you can actually um, just have a look at the booklet and all the maps and the pie chart. It's very visual and it's very real. It's not only number and tables and everybody can understand that and uh, it can really raise awareness about the distribution of the multilingual population in the area. So coming to the school census, um, exactly what to survey, uh, I think it could be uh, interesting. Are we going to survey the first language of the school children like it was done in other census, uh, for example, uh, that was in Great Britain? Um, are we, for example, we could decide to monitor the self-reported proficiency in the home and majority language. Uh, we could try to measure the exposure to the home language. Um, um, we could try to measure home literacy uh, in order to um, yeah, survey the need for supplementary instruction. We could survey the domains of language use. And one other thing that came up in multiple workshops that I conducted on the form was that we could mention the need for the family for, uh, we could mention in the form, the need for the family for having a mediation or a translation within the school and take it as an indicator of a general need of um, mediation services um, in general. And the last issue is how to name the concepts. Uh, so now it's mother tongue. I mentioned before first language, which was used in other census, uh, school census. Uh, but it could also be home language. I remember that in Catalina's workshop, they actually came up with the uh, home language. And that was also in multiple other workshops that I conducted. Kind of home language makes sense. Um, and uh, it's probably going to elicit the information that we want much more than mother tongue or first language or heritage language or whatever other concepts we may want to use. Yeah, so as I said, it it's still a little bit up in the air, but this is what I wanted to talk to you about. I think uh, this was my last slide. This is the my thank you to all the people involved in this project. I just take the occasion to mention them once again. So the uh, curation of the exhibition was from Rojas Loa and also with uh, advice from uh, Bora Axen from the museum. Vittorio dell'Aquila did the uh, maps. Um, and Lena Heinz did the, um, yeah, picked up the color and all the nice way they were set up was actually thanks to Lena. Yeah, I think that's it. And thank you very much. This is another illustration from Katarina Berndt. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions or comments, I would be happy to, to receive them. Oh, sorry, time for some hands on work is intended for a workshop. I, Forgot to delete that. <laughs> Fantastic. Molt bé, moltes gràcies, Maria. Ha estat genial. <laughs> jo bé, jo tinc preguntes, hi ha preguntes en el chat, uh, però abans d'això de, de, vull demanar si, si algú vol començar, demanant el que sigui. Uh, si no, començaré jo. No? Ah, mira, Narianda sí que en té. Era una mica, era una mica lenta amb les... Les um, Maria, si et sembla, faig les preguntes i els comentaris en català perquè um, m'hi sento Molt més bé. còmode que no pas en anglès. En tot cas, podem fer-ho en italià també però, perquè ens entenguem entre tots i com que parles un català fantàstic, ja ho he, ho he sentit al principi. Enhorabona per això també. Uh, bé, volia començar això, donant-te l'enhorabona per aquesta feinada i que, que em sembla molt, molt interessant i teniu bé, un, 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 
una responsabilitat, fins i tot, no? Perquè aquest, aquest enllaç que, que voleu fer entre la recerca i, i la gestió trobo que és fonamental. I, i per tant, doncs, endavant i, i moltes gràcies. Um, jo vaig treballar al SFPM Esparachikait d'Hamburg entre els anys 2005 i 2011 i, i, i m'ha agradat sentir-te perquè em feia la sensació de ser allà una altra vegada, no? I, i trobo que teniu material per fer un altre centre de recerca en multilingüisme perquè és, és fantàstic. I, i, I bé, una, una de les preguntes que, que tinc és, m'ha semblat bastant clau això que has comentat que la integració és, o en tot cas hauria de ser dinàmica, no? que no ha de ser només en el sentit de uh, l'immigrant ha d'aprendre la llengua del lloc on arriba, sinó que també ens, uh, en, ens hem de propar nosaltres o, o els, els del lloc a, a la llengua que arriba al lloc. No? I en això veig que a les escoles potser es comença a fer alguna cosa. Uh, tinc referències d'Hamburg també i, i aquí a, a Catalunya i, i, i a les Illes doncs, també intentem um, difondre aquestes idees. Uh, però no, no sé fins a quin punt tu ho veus que uh, comença a avançar la cosa o, o a banda de l'àmbit escolar si, si hi ha alguna mena d'aplicabilitat d'aquesta, d'aquesta idea. Has de moure. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, sí, um, és un, un dels temes els més difícils, jo crec, uh, perquè no hi ha molta, um, molta experiència. Um, vols dir que, vull, vull dir que, aunque la Unió Europea uh, pues aquest tema de la integració uh, mútua que ha de venir, que se, ha de ser dinàmica, ha de venir dels dos, de, les dos, de les dues partes i doncs no només de la part de l'immigrant que, que es té que integrar, sinó de la part de la població uh, que, que habita el lloc de més temps, que s'ha d'apropar d'alguna manera al migrant, no hi ha molta experiència en com concretament fer-ho. Uh, amb el tema de la participació pública, una de les coses que jo he vist que va bastant és que eh, molt, molt, molts grups polítics eh, ara tenen eh, aquesta habitud diguem, de, de fer els seus manifest electorals i les propagandes, no sé si és el tema correcte, però... Campanyes. Seva, sí. sí, campanyes. Um, de manera multilingüe, no tots, mm-hmm. però hi ha experiència a Catalunya també i a Alemanya i per totes parts, sobretot vers a la, a, a la població de, de, de majoria estrangera, clar. I clar, allà hi ha un, com un, un aim... Uh, mm-hmm. Pots parlar en anglès, eh? Si, 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 si no, pues, com... vaig Algun intentar, perquè ja m'estava pensant, vull fer la xarla en català, però després m'he dit, no, 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 que no vas trobar les paraules, no va poder expressar-te, però ara, respon... per contestar les preguntes, potser vaig a provar, eh, perquè m'agrada molt, en general. I, eh, doncs, vull dir que hi ha un objectiu molt concret, que és de ganyar... A ganyar gent perquè voti eh, i això però és una una de les coses que, que he vist que he notat eh, el tema de la integració socioeconòmica no, no hi ha res perquè la integració socioeconòmica és entesa totalment eh, amb, el, amb el sentit de la direcció d'aprendre la llengua d'acollida eh, perquè s'han d'integrar socioeconòmicament Um, sí que el tema de l'accés al servei bàsics eh, sí que hi ha coses perquè és molt elemental, jo diria, que per al tema dels serveis eh, s'ha de comprendre i doncs la, mm. molta, moltes vegades trobem eh, servicis que estan eh, pues, explicats en moltes llengües, això, això sí que està, això ja és un, són coses mm-hmm. és una manera de 
d'apropar-se, però estan fetes, jo diria, amb els temes d'emergència o de conveniència. Són serveis bàsics, campanyes electorals, i no de manera una mica més sistemàtica i general. Doncs ja hi ha moltes maneres en què això podria passar. Per exemple, un dels temes molt sentit, molt gran en aquest moment a Bremen, és que les llengües de major les llengües més grans immigrades, per exemple el turc, que siguin disponibles com segona llengua per passar l'examen de final d'escola. Perquè encara, jo ara em sembla que s'han de passar tres llengües estrangeres, dues llengües estrangeres, més a l'alemany, i seria bé que nens que tenen la migració nintxagrund poden passar una d'aquestes proves en la seva llengua. Per almenys, per exemple, el turc, que hi ha una majoria molt gran de nens que venen d'una... que tenen origen turca i que parlen turc com mutasprache. Això estaria, per exemple, seria una altra cosa de per encontrar-se d'algun lloc que sigui al mig, més o menys. Molt bé, gràcies. De res, gràcies a tu. Molt bé. Algú més vol fer una pregunta abans que jo em faci dues d'Anna Maria del Mar? No? D'acord. Ara sí. I de Maria, Anna Maria del Mar, m'ha escrit dues preguntes per tu perquè havia de partir. Una primera era que diu, has dit que algunes llengües s'ensenyaven a l'escola i ella volia saber una mica més com va això, quines llengües s'ensenyen i de quina manera. Sí, això és un tema que quan ens hem trobat els dades vam demanar al Ministeri de l'Educació les dades de quines llengües s'ensenyen a les escoles. I allà vam encontrar una mica de confusió. No estava massa clar. Semblava que era una cosa que no era centralitzada, que una mica era de responsabilitat dels barris mateix o de les escoles. Algunes llengües eren ensenyades a nivell de primària i de secundària com llengua materna, per nens que la tenien parlada a casa i altres eren ensenyades com llengua per tothom. I això és molt diferent, clar, perquè és molt diferent si vas ensenyar el turc a nens que parlen el turc a casa seves o turc per a tothom. I també hi havia la diferència que alguna... Alguns ensenyaments estaven a dintre de la institució escolar com curricular i altres estaven descentralitzats a altres associacions i, per exemple, als consulats i això. Clar, això funciona només... El consulat funciona per llengua que tenen un estat i com un poder d'algun tipus, per exemple, l'italià, l'espanyol, que tenen un ensenyament que està fet per al seu consulat. Altres llengües minoritzades, per exemple, el curdo o el català, no poden anar per aquesta via i han de trobar una altra. I hi ha associacions que estan com juntes a les institucions escolars i poden... Ara no sé veritament si hi ha per al curt ni el català, però sé que hi ha per l'aràbic, per l'àrab i per el polac. No, per el... Ara no me'n recordo d'altra qual era. Però hi ha altres, com a associacions que no són consulars i s'encarreguen de fer aquest ensenyament a nens que tenen la llengua a casa o a tothom. I això no és massa clar. És per això que veus que hi ha un símbol únic. Havien començat a fer diferents símbols per primària, secundària ha ensenyat fora de la institució escolar 
per altres constel·lacions de stakeholders i si era ensenyament llengua materna o ensenyament llengua estrangera. Però no era massa clar i ho vam abandonar i això és totalment un projecte de recerca que tenim allà i si algú vol començar, doncs tenim llista per començar a fer telefonades a les escoles, a les institucions, a les associacions, perquè s'ha de fer així per monitorar perquè no hi ha una visió junta d'això. O sigui, vols dir que fareu aquestes telefonades que voleu fer? És per saber com funcionen, no? Com quina que s'ensenya, com i tot això, no? Exacte, d'acord. S'ha exactament de de fer, to clarify with the single institutions. It's entirely clear from the files. D'acord. D'acord, moltes gràcies. D'acord, i ara té, de veritat, tenir una altra pregunta que també li interessava saber si s'encoratja a les famílies que mantinguin les llengües d'herència a casa, des de les institucions, l'escola, etc. Jo diria que sí, en general. Ara no ho puc no puc contestar aquesta pregunta de manera científica, diguem, o perquè no he fet recerca amb això, però com resident a Bremen jo diria que sí. En general, sí. Depèn una mica de la de l'actitud del single, per exemple, de la single mestra o institució. Però sempre continuen una mica d'attitudes i de pràctiques que, aunque la persona es diu sí que s'ha de mantenir la llengua d'herència, la llengua de casa, doncs aquestes pràctiques i attitudes doncs diuen una altra cosa. Doncs hi ha una mica... Per exemple, a l'escola que va la meva filla, és una política bastant acceptada que hi ha la regla que a l'iPad de l'escola no es poden utilitzar altres llengües que l'alemà. I també ha passat amb algunes escoles, especialment als barris amb més diversitat, que algunes escoles han tenit han hagut de prohibir llengües diferents que l'alemà al pati per alguns períodes. No en general, però perquè hi havia pelees entre els nens o passaven coses rares que els ensenyants, els mestres, no podien comprendre i això amenaçava una mica l'estabilitat de la cosa en general. Però sempre són mesures una mica extremes, diria jo, i transmeten una actitud no massa positiva vers la llengua. Jo m'he xocat una mica quan he rebut el papel, que no podia utilitzar altres llengües que... Perquè això és un messatge que ja ho he vist immediatament, que la meva filla personalment ha internalitzat molt profundament. Que no era la llengua apropiada en aquell context. Pareix una cosa així lleugera, però potser no, no tant. No, és curiós això que dius perquè jo tenia el màster aquest que fèiem a Holanda, a Tilburg, tenia companys que eren mestres d'escola d'infantil i primària que l'estudiaven i no havien estudiat lingüística ni res, el seu background era diferent i me venien i me deien, sí, és que a classe jo tinc alumnes que parlen entre ells en turc o que parlen tal, i clar, jo els dic que no han de parlar en turc perquè si no, no aprendran mai holandès i tal, i els a castig, i no sé què, ostres, però com els a castig, és tal. I ara és una cosa que com que és habitual sentir-ho, que te castiguen per parlar la llengua que no és holandès o en aquest cas alemany. Per tant, sí, sí. Té un seu sentit perquè les experiències que jo he rebut dels mestres és que és molt difícil 
manage... Uh, sí, como gestionar, ¿no? Gestionar una clase on los alumnos hablan muchas lenguas y en un grupo muy grande que tú no comprens. Uh -huh. comprens. Uh, yo me imagino que puede ser muy difícil. Um, ya. Yeah. Sí, sí, pero eso que deies tú, ¿no? Yo de, como de donar estrategias también y recursos que a partir de esas dades que se traen de esa recerca poder incluir, por ejemplo, personal material y personal de soporte en aquests, en aquests infants que hablan estas lenguas, no sé. No sé, no tengo idea. Sí, y cómo comunicar estas medidas extremas a la familia también, ¿no? Porque eh, tú, María, has entès mm, el, el, el que hay al darrere de esta medida, pero, pero claro, si lo hubiesen explicado en más detalle, entonces potser otras familias habrían podido explicar también a sus hijos de manera que, que, que no se avergonyessin o que no tinguessin mm. por de hablar la seva lengua en otras mm. situaciones o... Oh, normalmente, vaja. Claro, y aunque yo he hablado con las mismas filles y me han hablado de esto, esto es va tematizar, el mensaje ha pasado. Claro. Claro. Y aunque la nuestra lengua es una lengua estandarizada, utilizada para un estado nacional, muy prop, eh, prestigiosa, aunque es el italiano, mm. que no tiene esta cosa, es que potser otras lenguas al mateix context claro. también tienen muchas més, més cosas negativas. Eh, mm. Pero yo he visto que el mensaje ha pasado muy bien. Això no es la lengua que se ha de utilizar en un contexto público. Claro. Y ellos van a dejar de plan B, no sé si es una pregunta ya, pero no, ellos van a dejar de plan B. No, habían comenzado. Si van a dejar de sí. utilizar esta lengua, no la utilizaban. Es la lengua de casa. Es la lengua de casa, si no tenían otras, pero me imagino que podía pasar. Es el masaje, es el masaje en sí mismo. Claro, claro. 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 No ha tingut un, una consecuencia directa al seu comportament, yo creo. Uh -huh. De acuerdo. Um, Tenía otras preguntas, pero con que salem a acabar ahí mitja, em faré una de, de breu y ya ja lo dejamos, si vos parece bien. No sé si no sé que alguien vulgui demanar una, colga, una cosa abans. No, de acuerdo. Um, ¡Ay! ¡Ostras! Tens raó, Isabel. <laughs> ¡Ostras! Uh, 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 uh. 